Hello, everyone. Welcome from the Pierce Automotive Museum. I'm Jason, the Director of Education, and today we're shooting a video on something that's a little bit outside our previous stories. We've focused a lot on the science of cars, the history of cars. Today I'm taking it in a different direction and looking at the color of cars. Cars come in all kinds of different colors, including at times all, all kinds of colors on a single car. Why does this matter? Color doesn't affect performance or handling or anything like that. But generally speaking, color is one of the most identifiable features of a car. It's one of the things people notice first. They may start sorting out some shape ideas, SUV, sports car, whatever else. But usually when someone says, which car is yours, the answer is the blue one or something like that. So color is very important. And this importance of color transcends our culture and how we refer to it. When Aretha Franklin was driving down the freeway of love, she was doing so in a pink Cadillac. Okay? So there's all kinds of things that come together to explain what makes cars turn color. There's technology involved. There's economics involved. There's politics and science involved. One thing is it's usually a matter of individual choice, either by the choice of manufacturers or the choice of consumers. There have been a few exceptions to that. The first half century or so of racing is one of those cases. When racing first started taking off, basically pretty much anyone was going out. As it became more and more developed, and particularly as it took on a very national characteristic, you had the leading German builders going against the leading French builders and everything else. One of the ways they helped sort it out through, this wasn't government laws or anything, but kind of regulations among the racing circuits and everything else, is that there were national racing colors. So if you look at pictures of old races, you won't see all the advertising in that you see on race cars today. You will tend to see cars in one or two colors at most with a giant number on the side and on the front. That's how most race cars looked. And every country had a color like this. French. The French had blue. France had blue race cars. The British had British racing green. So this Jaguar XKSS we've talked about before was a case, it actually was delivered in white, but Steve McQueen wanted it in that British racing color, so painted it green, British racing green. The Italians, think of all those Ferraris and Alfa Romeos and Maseratis, right, racing in the, in the classic days. Red, red for speed. The Germans were either white or silver. The Americans, blue and white, white and blue, whichever order you want to put them in. Okay. It wasn't just the leading countries. Everyone had this. Spain was red and yellow. The Netherlands was green. Australia was gold and green. Brazil was yellow. Mexico was gold. Egypt was purple. Several countries were white and red. And Canada, Switzerland, and Poland. Some were blue and yellow. Sweden, it makes sense. It matches their national flag. Argentina is similar. It's a, a common color scheme. The other one was Siam. If you know the Siamese flag or the Thai flag for Thailand, what Siam became, neither flag had blue and gold as their color. But back in the 30s, there was a Thai prince who was really into racing, and he saw a picture once of a Swedish race fan in a beautiful blue and gold gown, and he decided that should be our country's race colors as well. The whole idea is you had countries that were identified by their colors. And this would actually come into play sometimes. In the early 20s, there was a race at the Target Floria. It was common back in the early days of racing, you would tend to be racing down just regular roads, that fans of other countries, race, would get in, the, in your way and everything else to slow you down. So Target Floria Italian race was notorious for people jumping out in front of non-Italian cars. So Mercedes, a German company that one year decided to paint their cars red, and bypass the whole thing because it tricked everyone into thinking they were an Italian racer coming down the way. This national racing color tended to go away by the late 60s, moving to the 70s, because eventually the sponsors took over. The Lotus teams, which would have traditionally been in British racing green, started painting their colors in the red and white, um, the painted their liveries in the red and white colors of their sponsor. And so nowadays you see all kinds of different colors and everything else. But if you look closely, you will notice there are trends. Ford America, lots of blues and whites. Ferraris are still dominantly painted in red, and Porsche nearly all the time you will see in white. So even though the regulations governing national racing colors have all fallen by the wayside, there is still a cultural trend 
towards keeping up with some of these. It's still common to see them. But it's not all about racing. Colors matter for our cars as well. Early cars tended to see a variety of colors, right? Basically what they could do. But the, the paint used and everything else wasn't ideal. It was what they'd been used in characters and like, and it was an oil-based paint. It took a long time to apply, a long time to dry, and it tended to not hold up well, particularly in the right frequent driving at speed, getting lots of um, dealing with the elements and everything else. Paints tended to be yellow on that, so it didn't really maintain maintain their glory. And to keep it looking all fresh, you had to keep repainting it, which, like I said, was an expensive and time-consuming process. Things did change with Henry Ford. The old adage is you could have your Model T in any color as long as it was black. In all reality, the first year or two Model Ts were produced, you could get them in about a half dozen different colors, none of which were black. But by 1910, Henry Ford started developing a way, instead of using oil-based paints, he shifted to an, a more asphalt-based process. It allowed paints to be applied much quicker and for them to dry much faster. This was perfect, because keep in mind, based on previous discussions, it's also the Model T that you're seeing the rise of mass production. Cars are being produced much quicker. You don't have time to wait for the paint to dry. The problem is, is that in every Ford's process, black was really the only color he could really get to dry properly and everything else. So for a good long while, Model T black is what the most common color for cars was. This would begin changing by the 20s. People started developing new ways of using stuff like Chinese wood oil and the like that would give you a little bit more variety in colors, but still get you the benefits of easy application, quicker drives that Henry Ford's techniques had been doing for black for, for a decade or so. Okay. What really took off is when General Motors, in partnership with DuPont, came up with the Duco paints. Okay. These provided a host of different colors in a quick drying, easy to apply format that allowed you to maintain the pace of mass production and the low prices of paint application to keep cars in the hands of the middle class, but gave you a wide variety of colors to choose from. This color selectability, all kinds of options, became a prime marketing technique. So this ad isn't necessarily an ad for Lincoln, it's an ad for Duco paints and all the different colors you can get your car in. Okay? So paint color diversity becomes important. At this time, bright, shiny colors were in. It was splashy, right? In the 20s, it's the days of flappers and Charleston and everything else. People want to be showy, so bright colors. This one, the um, 1929 Ruxton in the Peterson Collection, has been restored, but it was restored to its original period correct paint color. Okay? Splashy purples and all that, right? By the 30s, you're in a Great Depression. People's moods are a little bit more dour, right? There's a toning down of things. So blacks and browns and that become a lot more popular. So a lot of cars you see in the 30s, you look at old gangster movies or the like, they tend to be a bunch of black cars racing around. The other thing going on in the 30s, though, if you could afford it, is that this is when you have the introduction of metallic paints. Okay? Some of the earliest versions of putting stuff in the paint to make them more shiny and all that was using fish scales. And it would take thousands and thousands of fish to provide enough scales to create one car for the paint. But eventually they start putting metal flake in and everything else. So you've got these very shiny, very glistening types of colors that would really be, uh, would be a draw. But they were expensive. So it was only those that had enough wealth and all that that they could ignore the depression and everything else and, and do what they want, which is to make a very shiny car. Coming after the war, you have all kinds of prosperity, and you also have, with the rise of the interstates and everything else, people get in their cars more. Cars are becoming less, well, they're still utilitarian, but people are also wanting cars that are comfortable and stylish. So you get an explosion of different types of designs, right? Flashy reds become popular. Two-toning becomes popular, where part of your car would be one color or not. You had seen this earlier on, again, for aesthetic reasons, but the idea is, is that colors become, is going to become a very important part of what drives consumers to pick one car over the other. They may sit here and look at performance and all that. 
in choosing between models and makes, but in the end, they're also wanting a car that matches their own aesthetic style. This is frequently on copy the dominant aesthetics of the day. So in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, you start seeing the greens and browns and yellows and that, the pastel colors that were also what people were painting their houses with, copied over to the car. By the time you get to the later 60s into the 70s, this is the time of environmental movements, right? Earth Day and everything else. Earth tones become very popular, the browns, the dark blues, and everything else. Right here again, it's the color of our cars are matching the dominant aesthetics of the day. Nowadays, carrying this image through, um, through, these are the dominant colors you see on cars on the road today. By most studies of what colors sell, what cars are selling and everything else, okay, it is whites, blacks, and grays. Okay? Basically, about 13% of car sales over the past few years have been black, about 15% have been white, roughly a quarter of all cars sold are gray or silver. Why would that be the case? Okay. Here again, it's the dominant aesthetics. Think of the phone you carry around or the laptop you use. A lot of our technologies are whites, blacks, and grays or silvers. That brush metal look or whatever not that you see on the top of a laptop. The black sheer case you see on the back of your phone, or perhaps white sheer case you have on your phone. There are other options you have. You can get a blue phone or a purple phone or everything else. But generally speaking, most of our technology, this monitor is all black. This keyboard is gray, right? These are the colors that tend to get tied to the technology in our mind. Since we're in a technological moment, our cars tend to reflect that. And there may be some other reasons as well, right? Maybe not so much for white or black, but silver, gray cars, most of the road dirt you get and everything else, the stuff that makes your car dirty, is grayish. You don't notice a gray car being dirty quite as quick as you do other ones. Gray cars, silver cars are also very popular with designers compared to, say, a red one. Designers wanting to show off their creation want you to see the shadows. They want you to see every line in a car. The thing about colors such as red is a lot of the detail the car gets washed out because the red's so dominantly bright, right? It overtakes your vision. But certain shades of silver and all that actually let you see each shadow a little bit more, which if you're the designer of the car is what you're trying to emphasize. So the idea is, is there's any number of reasons, right? Dominant colors of the world, right, at a particular moment, right? Design questions everything else. There's all kinds of things that go into the choice to make a car a certain color. But in the end, usually the dominant concern, what do people want? Because it's consumers that are in the end going to give the car makers money for a car. You want to try to make it something that they would want to grab. And if people can't find it, they may go off and make it their own. So all these factors come to play. And here again, just like we talked about at the beginning with racing, okay? Sometimes it's just something as simple as national pride, right? There's all kinds of different designs. This guy, to celebrate the World Cup, decided to paint his old Volkswagen green and yellow, Brazil's colors, to celebrate his team. In 1976, America was celebrating a bicentennial. All of it was patriotic pride, proud to be an American. The most popular cars that year, colors of cars that year, red, white, and blue. Thank you for joining us. We'll have more entertaining options. This gave you a good example, right? I'm not here to give you another activity, but take anything you do. We like to paint these little wooden cars. Gives you all types of creativity to come up with different ways. Even as simple as something as pulling a coloring sheet, like you will find on peterson.org. And think of what color car you would want. Sometimes it may be a single color. Sometimes it may be striped. The options are yours. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.